We are in Hebrews chapter 7 today, roughly page 1170 in the scriptures. Continuing in our doctorate level thesis that is Hebrews, an epistle to a letter to the Hebrews, the Hebraic Jewish, if you would, although Hebrew means way more than Jewish, but allow me that. Believers in Mashiach and Messiah, a letter of encouragement to them to and to admonish them not to fall back into their old ways of the systematic doctrinal dogmas of men belief system, but to continue in the belief of Yeshua. It's what we have here in Hebrews. And Hebrews does a lot to um, it establishes Yeshua as high priest and it explains the new or renewed covenant. That's incredibly important to understand that covenants do not replace one another. Covenants stack. They land on top of one another and on top of one another and on top of one another. And an example of this, a simple one, is the covenant that the father makes with Noah after the great flood, Genesis 6, 7, 8 that uh, he puts a rainbow in the sky to remind his children that never again will he destroy the earth via water. Never again. Next time is by fire, which is Torah. There's two ways that we clean things, which is exactly what the father did. He was cleaning up the mess of polluted DNA from the watchers in Genesis 6 verse 4 with water. Mikvah, baptism, cleaning through water. And why is the rainbow so important? Well, at that point, it had never rained on the earth. Then all these clouds rolled in, and then the heavens opened, and the earth and everything in it was destroyed except for eight people. And the bloodlines that the Father chose to preserve on the Ark of Noah. And so, it's a pretty traumatic experience. And so the Father said, I'll put a rainbow in the sky, so the next time you see clouds, you know I'm not going to destroy you. It's a sign of reassurance. Has the Father since destroyed the world via flooding? Negative. So that covenant's still in play, right? So covenants stack. They do not replace one another. That's really important to understand. And so as we dive into Hebrews chapter 7, if you have not been following along, you need to have been, you need to do the contextual homework around what we're discussing here. So we see in verse 20 of 6, where Yeshua has entered as a forerunner for us, having become high priest forever, to the according to the order of Melchizedek. You know, we've talked about Melchizedek quite a bit in these videos. The righteous king of Salem. Wrote, What's righteousness? Blamelessly walking in the commands of Yah. That's a New Testament definition, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verse 6. Look it up for yourself. Blamelessly walking in the commands of Yah is righteousness. It says that in the New Testament for you New Testament believers. And Salem, right? Salem means salam, shalom, peace, the king of peace. How many people have referred to Jesus as the prince of peace? Right? Okay. For this Melchizedek... King of Salem, the King of Peace. And what does Melchizedek mean? Malki or Malik means king, and Zadik means righteous. He's the King of Righteousness. For this King of Righteousness, the King of Peace, priest of the Most High Elohim, which, let's just stop right there. Your inheritance through the seed of Abraham, who is Yeshua, whose blood you're covered by, is unto Elohim. How many Big C, Churchianity, Sunday Christians even know Elohim. You don't know Elohim. You need to. That's why Yeshua came. Get off the milk and get on to the meat. For man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word of Yahuwah or Elohim. Every word. Not the ones you like. Not the ones that are comfortable. Every word of Elohim. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High Elohim, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. Yeah, this happens in Genesis 14, verses 17 through 20. To whom Abraham 
to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, tithed. Abraham tithes to Melchizedek. And we know that tithing goes from the less powerful to the more powerful, and blessing goes from the more powerful to the less powerful. Abraham also gave a tenth of all, his name being translated indeed king of righteousness, blamelessly walking in the commands of Yah, a.k.a. Torah, king of keeping the Torah, and then also king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but having been made like the son of Elohim, remains a priest for all time. Now, many messianics, and this is important to note, many messianics will say that Melchizedek was Shem, the son of Noah. Noah. And there's good evidence for this. There's certainly the Jewish oral tradition for this. The problem with the Jewish oral tradition for this is that the Jews deny Messiah, and I don't. And so if we're going to base the fact that Shem is, was, is Melchizedek on the Jewish oral traditions, which certainly can be profitable for fleshing out the bones of this word, we therefore have to deny what it says here in Hebrews. And that transgresses the doctrine of inerrancy, which means that this entire word is the inspired word of God. So I don't believe that Melchizedek was Shem because it says right here that this <laughs> king of righteousness and then also king of Salem, that is king of peace, without father, Shem had a father, Noah, without mother, Noah's wife, without genealogy, well, clearly Shem had a genealogy, having neither beginning of days, Shem was born, nor end of life, Shem died, but having been made like the son of Elohim, well, who's the son of Elohim? Yeshua remains a priest for all time. And so I believe that Melchizedek, when we meet him in Genesis, was the physical manifestation of Yahuwah or Elohim, the Lord our God. Well, when Yahuwah takes physical form on planet Earth, how does he do that? What we know as Yeshua and I believe if you read this word, you'll find many, many, many instances of God made flesh. Not just when he hung upon the stake to atone for our sins as Messiah ben Joseph, which is biblical prophecy, and who will return at the end of days as Messiah ben David to rule as a righteous king on the throne of David in Jerusalem. By the way, all you people who are like, I don't do that Old Testament Jewish stuff. You should read your freaking Bible, man. Who is it that you even believe in? You can't have a biblical Mashiach if you don't understand him, a biblical Messiah. Where do all the prophet, prophecies of Messiah come from? The Old Testament. What happens in Revelation, which is in the New Testament? There's a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem. And guess what? The king, Messiah, reigns as a king in the line of David, which if you read 1 Kings, 2 Kings, Chronicles, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, the house of David can only have a king sit upon the throne if he is a righteous man who guards all the commands of Yah. So what's Yeshua going to be doing? Guarding all the commands of Yah, which is backed up by John 15, verse 10. I, if you love me, keep my commands as I have kept my father's commands. Righteousness. Blamelessly walking in the commands of Yah, Luke 1, verse 6. So it all makes sense if you just read your damn Bible, okay? So this Yeshua has come to earth many times to interface with the Father's people. I believe that he blessed Abraham as Melchizedek and taught Abraham and Isaac as Melchizedek. And I also believe that it is this man of God that Jacob wrestles with in Genesis 32 when his name is changed from Jacob or Yaakov, he who has a hand upon the heel, the supplanter in Hebrew, to Israel, he who overcomes. And you can see that backed up in Revelation 2 and 3. Go through and read Revelation 2 and 3 and underline everywhere that it says, to he who overcomes. That's Israel. That's why you want to be Israel. You want to be grafted into the tree of life. What's that, Romans 11? Grafted into the tree of life. You are the branches, right? Well, branches, if you know anything about agriculture, have to get grafted into rootstock 
lest they die. What's the rootstock? The Old Testament, homeboy. But I digress. We're definitely not going to make it to chapter 8 in this video. That's okay. We'll do 7 today. My wife's over there smirking at me. Now see how great this one was, this Melchizedek, whom even the ancestor Abraham gave a tenth of his choicest booty. So Melchizedek was so great that even Abraham, the father of uh, Christianity, the father of Judaism, and the father of Islam, the anointed of Yahuwah or Elohim, tithed to. That makes it clear that this was not a person. This was God made flesh. And truly, those who are of the sons of Levi, and see, this is important to understand here. We're talking about in chapter 7, the balance, the push-pull, the dichotomy between the Levitical priesthood and the order of Melchizedek, because Yeshua is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. He is not a priest in the order of Levi, which is, again, why you should be familiar with the Torah if you have any hope of understanding the New Testament. And truly, those who are the sons of Levi, who receive the priesthood, have a command to receive tithes from the people according to the Torah, that is, from their brothers, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. However, the one whose genealogy is not derived from them, Yeshua, receives tithes from Abraham, Melchizedek, and blessed the one who held the promises, Abraham. So Melchizedek blesses Abraham. And it is beyond all dispute that the lesser is blessed by the better. So Melchizedek is better than Abraham because he is God-made flesh, Yeshua. And Abraham tithes to Melchizedek because his priesthood exceeds the priesthood of the Levitical order. Which begs the question, why was the Levitical order instituted in the first place? Because it was given to Moses on Mount Sinai by the hand of God in order that the tribe of Levi would be in service to the Father's house, the tabernacle, to teach and to lead these people, 603,550 military-aged males who wandered in the wilderness so that they would learn the ways of Yah. And so it was to form an institute around practicing the ways of Yah, being righteous, blamelessly walking in the commands. And so it took a group of men in order to administer that, to keep the, the Israelites, the Hebrews in the wilderness, in service to the Father. Okay? But Yeshua, being much more powerful than that, is not beholden to the trappings of men within the Levitical priesthood. Now, it's God-given, it's God-ordained, it's commanded of the Levites that they're going to do this. However, they are simply men. They are not God-made flesh. And that's why Yeshua rules in the order of Melchizedek, which comes straight from the Father, not in the Levitical priesthood. Verse 8, And here it is men who die, the Levites, that receive tithes, but there is someone of whom it is witnessed that he lives, Yeshua and Melchizedek. And one might say that though Abraham, I'm sorry, that through Abraham, even Levi, who received tithes, gave tithes, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So the point that Priscilla or Shaul or whoever it is that's writing this Hebrews, which we've discussed in previous videos, the point that the author is making here is that even Levi tithed to Melchizedek when he was still in the loins of Abraham. And so this is hearkening back to the Levitical order being subservient to the order of Melchizedek, because even the Levites paid tribute to Melchizedek while they were still in the loins of Abraham. Truly, then, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, perfection, if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people were given the Torah, the Torah being the written rules of what had already previously been an oral tradition handed down from father to son, father to son, first given from Yahuwah or Elohim to Adam, from Adam to Enoch, from Enoch to Noah, from Noah to Shem, from uh, Shem to Abraham, Isaac, to Jacob, to the 12 tribes. Then they go into uh, Egypt for 430 years and they lose it. They lose the oral tradition. They lose the doing of the things. They forget how to do it because they were slaves for 430 years, which is why Moses brings them out, called out by the Father, brings them out of this false system of worship in Mitzrayim in Egypt to the wilderness to go worship. And they don't know what the hell to do. That's why the Father gives them the Torah on Mount Sinai. 
This is not doctrines and dogmas of men. This is the commands of God given to Moses to establish the Levitical priesthood, to relearn, to redo all of the things that they used to know how to do, to return back to Elohim. Okay? So truly then, if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people were given the Torah, why was there still a need for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek? and not be called according to the order of Aaron, Aaron being the Levitical priesthood. For the priesthood being changed, of necessity there takes place a change of law also. Now, people will take this one verse right here and say, look, the priesthood was changed, we, there was a change to the law, we don't have to do this anymore. Negative. All this means is there's a changing of the law from the order of Aaron and the Levitical priesthood back to, back to, the order of Melchizedek, which comes straight from the Father. And so this law means that you're no longer under the laws of men, the Levitical priests. You're under the laws of God, which is where the order of Melchizedek came from in the first place. So this is not a removal of the law. This is a reestablishment of the authority, the authority of the law back under the Father, because Melchizedek was Yeshua, God made flesh. And so as we return back to a Melchizedekian priesthood, all the authority of the Father backs this law now, not simply the man-made authority given by the Father to the Levitical priesthood. So you're not absolved from doing the law. Now you are 100% held accountable to the Father for not doing the law. Ooh. Ooh. Ouch. For he of whom this is said belongs to another tribe. This being Yeshua was not of the Levites. He was of the tribe of Judah. Oh, you mean Jesus was a Jew? Yes, literally Jesus was a Jew. For he of whom this is said belongs to another tribe from which no one had attended at the slaughter place because Judah was the line of kings, not the line of the Levites. They were not in service to the temple. For it is perfectly clear that our master arose from Judah, a tribe about which Moses never spoke of concerning the priesthood. And this is clearer still. If another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, Yeshua, who has become not according to the Torah of fleshly command, the Levitical priesthood, but according to the power of an endless life, the Melchizedekian priesthood by Yeshua, according to the power of an endless life. You want eternal life, right? An endless life, Yeshua. Matthew 19, verse 17, Master, Master, what do I do to have eternal life? Guard the commands. Pick up your Bible and read it for yourself. Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 19, verse 17. If you wish to enter into life, guard the commands. Not the Torah of the fleshly command, not the Levitical priesthood, but according to the power of an endless life. Yeah, there was a change in the priesthood. You can't say that you don't have to do it anymore because it comes straight from God. And it is witnessed here that in Hebrews that Yeshua is the high priest. And if you deny the doing of this, you are denying the high priest. If you don't do the Torah, you deny Yeshua. Boom. Ouch. Ooh. That one stings. Yeah. Transgressing the word is sin. Yeshua is the Word made flesh. Think about that. You transgress the Word, you transgress Messiah. Matthew 5, 17. I come not to destroy the Torah or the prophets, but to complete it, to fulfill it, is the Hebrew word. The Greek word is plerau, which means to embody it. I come to fulfill the law, to fill it up. For truly, truly, I say unto you, until heaven and earth pass away, the same heaven and earth that Moses calls to witness against the Israelites when they receive this command, until heaven and earth passes away, not one jot, not one tittle, not the smallest mark in the Torah shall fall away. Not even a little of it. And so the whole idea that, oh, that's Jewish stuff, we don't have to do that. Well, if you follow Messiah... You 100% have to do that because the priesthood has been changed. And by necessity, there's a change of the law also. Yet you are beholden to the Son of God now, not a Levitical priest, if you don't do these things. Let me repeat that. You are beholden now to the Son of God, not a Levitical priest, if you don't do these things. Sin is transgression of the law, 1 John 3, verse 4. 
you transgress the word of God, well, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Yeshua, Jesus. Go ahead. Sin all you want. Break the Torah all you want. But don't claim the name of Jesus if you do, because that gets you into Matthew 7, 21 territory. Master, Master, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many mighty works in your name? And truly I shall, I shall say unto them, Depart from me, you who work lawlessness. Depart from me, you who are doing lawlessness, for I never knew you. One more witness to this. Revelation. The Antichrist is referred to as the man of lawlessness. Go ahead. Preach lawlessness. Preach the law was done away with all you want. Go ahead. Believe that all you want. Walk in that all you want. The Antichrist is the man of lawlessness. Yeshua, who reigns as a king on the throne of David, is a man who upholds the Father's law and returns the Father's people to him through the doing of the law. You can have a Messiah who does away with the law. You just can't have a biblical Messiah who does away with the law. We've already seen a lawless son of God. His name is Satan. Go ahead. Follow the lawless son of God. See how far that gets you. Verse 17, for he does witness, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. For there is indeed a setting aside of the former command because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the Torah perfected nothing but the bringing in of a better expectation through which we draw near to Elohim. So the Torah, the Levitical priesthood got us this far, got us to Yeshua. And now this authority goes back to Yeshua in the order of Melchizedek, through which we draw near to Elohim. We don't do these things because by works we will experience the face of God and come into his presence. We do these things out of obedience to our Messiah, Yeshua, who is the high priest, through which we draw near to Elohim. We have one intercessor, which is the next chapter, chapter 8, and that's Yeshua. Nobody comes to the Father but through me, through which we draw near to Elohim. And it was not without an oath, for indeed, for they indeed became priests without an oath, but he... Yeshua became priest with an oath by him, Yahuwah, who said to him, Yeshua, Yahuwah has sworn and shall not regret, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. How do you not understand that the Father has given his authority to the Son to reign as priest? Don't tell me the priesthood was done away with. The priesthood has been moved to Yeshua out of the hands of men because the hands of men couldn't administer it. Doctrines and dogmas of men, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, don't work. What does work? Read the book and do what it says. Follow Mashiach, Messiah. Be a Christian, which means Christios, which means follower of Christ. Follow him. Do what he did. Do what he tells you to do. Not what some priest or rabbi or bishop told you to do. Not even what I told you to do. Read the Bible and do what it says. What would Jesus do? He'd keep the Torah and he'd serve Yah. Ecclesiastes 12 verses 13 and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the matter. Serve God and keep his commands. By as much as this, Yeshua has become a guarantor of a better covenant because it's perfect. It's within the hands of Yah. And indeed, those that became priests were many because they were prevented by death from continuing. We needed multiple priests in the Levitical priesthood because they kept dying because they were human. But he, Yeshua, because he remains forever, has an unchangeable, unchangeable priesthood. Malachi 3, verse 6, I'm the Lord Yahuwah Sabaoth, I change not. An unchangeable priesthood. Oh, well, that was all done away with. Cool, you deny the words of the Bible. Good for you. Therefore, he, Yeshua, is also able to save completely those who draw near to Elohim through him, ever living to make intercession for them. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, kind, innocent, undefiled, having been separated from sinners. From sinners. What is sin? 
1 John 3, verse 4, it's lawlessness. Having been separated from the lawless and exalted above the heavens, who does not need, as those high priests, to offer up slaughter offerings day by day for his own sins, because he was perfect and without sin. What does without sin mean? He was without lawlessness. Jesus was without lawlessness. Perfect and without sin. And then for those of the people, for he did this once upon the stake for all when he offered himself up. For the Torah appoints as high priests men who have weaknesses, but the word of the oath from God, which came after the Torah, appoints the Son, having been perfected forever. So, Yeshua, this high priest, in the order of Melchizedek, and the idea that the priesthood was done away with is ludicrous and completely against the words in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews in the Bible. The authority of that priesthood no longer resides in the hands of men. It resides in the hands of the Son of God. And if you deny the word of God, you deny Yeshua himself. Bless y'all. Shalom.